Hey guys, today we install the drive unit on the Mini Model S. All right, welcome back. So this is the drive unit for the Mini Model S, and um, this drive unit will be mount, mounted uh, at the center of the axle here, and um, the um, it'll be mounted in such a way that um, I want it. I don't want it offset to the side, even though the sprocket is offset to the side. I really want the drive unit in the middle for a number of reasons, um, just symmetry, but also weight distribution, and um, uh, plus the curve of the body allows more, more room underneath the body for the drive unit to, um, uh, to reside. And um, now, those of you that have built go-karts in the past may be wondering why I have the brake disc mounted way over to the side and the sprocket way over to the side. Why not put one or the other in the middle? Especially if I put the sprocket in the middle, I could more easily mount the drive unit in the middle. Because as it is, to mount it in the middle, I'm going to have to extend the jack shaft and bearing support to move the chain over. Why don't I just move the sprocket inboard? Well, there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, the primary reason is this vehicle is so small that literally the, uh, in fact, I can't even really fit a true seat uh, inside the, the car here. So um, more than likely, I'm just going to build a, a bit of a sort of a, a shelf that's just very short uh, and flat to sit on that I'll, I'll pad because there really isn't even room for a, a seat in here. But it's um, where, where the driver's butt resides is going to be really near the axle. So that meant that forced the sprocket and the brake disc to be moved way to the outside because the curve of the seat will provide clearance for the, the uh, brake disc and for the sprocket. So uh, this thing is so small that gaining a couple of inches is monumental in, in uh, the ability to sit inside this. So for that reason, uh, anything on the axle that increases diameter has to be moved to the outside. And um, so, but um, uh, again, this is, um, this, this project is, it's based uh, somewhat on the, um, this drive unit that, uh, that I make for bicycles. This is what I call the Da Vinci drive. It is a, um, a brushless, permanent magnet brushless DC motor with a, a toothed belt. This happens to be five millimeter pitch and it is 25 millimeters wide. And uh, that drives uh, a pulley to a jack shaft uh, to an output sprocket that on a bicycle would normally go to a sprocket at the rear wheel. And this freewheels. So as the unit drives forward, the freewheel grabs. But then uh, when normally a bicycle would be coasting forward, this would freewheel. Now, um, I'm torn between leaving the freewheel on or not. There really isn't. Uh, any appreciable amount, a very tiny amount, but not enough um, regen uh, available through a system like this. And on a vehicle this small, I don't know that regen or electronic braking is going to do me much good. So I'll probably leave the freewheel on. I'm going to use a bicycle chain. This is a bicycle sprocket on the rear. It's just, it's some um, componentry that I have laying around from the electric bikes that I build. And I put huge power through, um, this happens to be a White Industries Trials freewheel, and I put 50 horsepower through these freewheels. Uh, I use an extra thick uh, side plate bicycle chain, so uh, designed for trials riding, so it's not your typical weak bicycle chain. Um, so anyway, being that this is based on bicycle equipment, I'm going with what I've got, and the quality of high-end bicycle equipment is actually very high. So anyway, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to extend extend the jack shaft and also the, the bearing support tube to move the drive unit to the middle of the axle. And it will also be dropped down uh, as low as is, as is practical. And um, so, and then also, once this is mounted, the motor itself and this, this front housing plate can be clocked around this in relation to the jack shaft bearing tube and I'll go more into that in depth later but so once it's installed I'll be able to swing it back or forward to provide clearance for the body and for where my uh, my seat seat back is going to be so that's where the drive unit will mount 
the motor controller will probably mount right here and um, uh, the batteries as per Tesla design will be in the floor so yeah uh, step one is to pull the drive unit apart and um, you know look for the components uh, in my inventory that I need to increase the length of the jack shaft so the uh, the jack shaft that this particular drive uses is a 7 8 inch uh, jack shaft now I also um, I have two different uh, bearings that I use that are the same OD so that they can press into the bearing tube and they have an ID of either 7 8 inch uh, it's a needle bearing for 7 8 inch shaft or half inch which is a a roller a ball bearing this particular drive has a 7 8 shaft so I've got another 7 8 shaft from the drawer here so we'll see what the length would be and that looks to be the perfect length to move the drive unit uh, right to the middle of the chassis so we'll go ahead and use this jack shaft to um, uh, to lengthen the, the overall um, bearing tube and step the drive unit over to the right need to machine the ends of the shaft this is a uh, double set screw 90 degree offset uh, fastening method so um, so that'll be the next step to chuck this in the mill and uh, machine what I need to in the shaft now the first thing I'm going to do to prep that is grind the areas to be machined because this is a case hardened shaft so I want to break some of that case hardening so that um, uh, the, the mill can uh, bite better into the material So there's some uh, just basic grinding to put two flats in the shaft, uh, 90 degrees circumferentially from each other. Uh, the next step is to chuck this into the milling machine and go ahead and mill a slot for one of the set screws. So we have the milling machine right next to us here. great just have to clean it up deburr a couple of edges and uh, we'll be good to go now on this particular drive unit belt tension is handled by this screw here if you can see um, that screw pushes on a finger that swings this out so if you watch as I spin this screw the belt tightens up and as I loosen that spin that screw out then I can swing the motor inward and loosen the belt up to remove it and also just to adjust tension so that's the way this particular drive unit works so we'll go ahead and remove that belt now I can slip the jack shaft out and um, there's our jack shaft and here's our here's our jack shaft bearing tube right there and that bearing tube I'll have to lengthen and um, to accommodate the larger jack shaft but uh, the first thing before that is the jack shaft here is mounted to a hub that the pulley screws to and it is TIG welded around the end uh, I do have more of these hubs and I'll check and see if I've got enough of them but uh, I can also uh, they're just it's surface TIG welded so I can also spin it on the lathe and cut this end off and uh, there's enough shoulder on that hub to cut it and reuse it several times if need be so we'll go ahead and do that next All right. well 
looks like um, I actually have quite a few of these hubs. So what I'm going to do, this is a common length jack shaft and, uh, for that hub. So I'm going to remove this and um, put this jack shaft uh, just in the drawer for future use. And I'm going to weld a new hub to my new jack shaft, which will weld on, get TIG welded on right on the end there. You'll see there's a keyway. That keyway is not needed. So it'll be surface welded around the lip. And then the, um, the free wheel will mount to the end of the jack shaft. One set screw will go in that groove. One will rest on that flat. And this mounting method is, um, uh, it, it is extremely strong. Uh, a keyway would be slightly stronger. However, this particular, um, this partic particular uh, freewheel adapter was not broached for a keyway and just uses two hardened set screws. And I've never had an issue with this much power. Now, if I were running a, a drive system with two motors, I would definitely go with a keyway. Now, I do have a, a couple of bikes that are built with two motors that just use these, these um, set screw, um, the slot and a flat, and it's adequate, but you can tell it's kind of pushed right to the edge. So for a single motor, this is great. For two motors, it's functional, but at its limit, so then I run a keyway. But in this application, this will work fine. So I'm going to go ahead and TIG weld the surface there, and then start um, uh, moving all the parts over to this new, this longer uh, setup. And I also need to make a new bearing tube. I can press out these needle bearings from this tube, but uh, I'll probably have more in stock, so I'll check my inventory on that. So yes, I do have a couple of new needle bearings, so I'll just press new needle bearings into a new jack shaft tube, but first uh, I need to TIG weld uh, these two parts together, so I will clean those, uh, mount them in a, in a vise, and uh, go ahead and TIG them down. All right, so I'm going to leave that to cool. Um, very little filler rod is needed for that. Typically, I use filler rod to fill in the hole where, the, um, uh, where that keyway slot is, and then I just do a fusion weld around the surface. And I always go around twice because I found that uh, if I go around once, I can get a light crack in the weld because the material hasn't sufficiently preheated. So I go around to fuse it, then I go around again nice and slow to get some depth to the weld as well as to heat the material. So uh, I'll go ahead and show you here. Uh, these are just spacers to hold it up in the right position. But uh, so there's the surface weld, and uh, you know it turned out pretty well. I uh, I've done a lot of this, and um, so I'll dress the the edge uh, just from a little bit of weld over the top. But uh, so we'll let that sit and cool while I uh, further work on the drive system, disassemble it further, and begin working on the the uh, bearing tube. This is the drive unit mount. Uh, I, uh, I typically refer to it as the mount foot. And um, it has um, holes drilled and tapped on both sides to be uh, mounted between captured plates. And then the jack shaft bearing tube slides through and it's pinch clamped down. And if you remember earlier, I mentioned how the drive unit can be clocked. It can be rotated around and then locked down at whatever position I want relative to the mounting points. So this, this mount foot will be mounted to the frame somewhere in this vicinity, and it'll be on a slotted mount to allow it to move fore and aft to allow for chain tension adjustment. So um, one of the nice things about this particular drive unit, if you look at this, this is a uh, permanent magnet brushless DC motor, and the windings are actually attached to the can. Now, being that the windings are attached to the can, the can itself is directly... Uh, it's within an eighth of an inch away from the, the windings. This drive unit, the motor slides into it and then it pinch clamps around the motor can. That means that the heat from the motor can is directly shed right into the housing of this drive unit. Very, very effective for um, internal cooling of the motor. Uh, also, this silver plate that is screwed down with four small screws to the face of the motor that has an additional support bearing. These motors were originally designed to either drive a, a propeller shaft for, um, they've been used in 
oh gosh, watercraft uh, and uh, also aircraft where they're, the shaft is supporting a propeller, but they're not very often mounted in an application such as mine with a belt. When you're using a, a belt, there's a lot of, of um, angular load, a lot of um, side load on the shaft, puts, and it puts a lot of load on the bearing inside the motor can. So this plate holds a second bearing. So now there's two bearings stacked next to each other to support that side load of the belt. Believe it or not, even though this is a case-hardened shaft, without the second bearing, after a few years of use, the shaft, the case hardening, can actually narrow inside the bearing and the shaft will begin to wiggle. Plus the bearing can wear out. So I found stacking two bearings prolongs the life of the bearings and eliminates that shaft wear and just makes the motor an, an overall much longer lasting item. And considering the fact that these motors are $900, just the motor, not the drive unit, just the motor by itself, 900 bucks, I want to protect that. So, all right, we'll go ahead and... Um, start uh, setting up the materials to make the new jack shaft bearing tube. Oh, also, incidentally, uh, if you remember, I, I mentioned that I'll be reusing, saving and reusing this, this shaft that was TIG welded to that hub. I'm going to do the same with this jack shaft bearing tube. Since I have other bearings to use, I'm going to go ahead and save this bearing tube because this shaft length and this bearing tube length is a common size for my bicycle systems that I build for customers. So we'll go ahead and set that aside and save it. And we'll remove all of these six mounting screws to get the pulley off uh, to be able to transfer it over to the, um, to the new jack shaft assembly there. Success. So we'll put that together with the uh, with the bearing tube, and we'll set this aside. I have a drawer for components like this. We'll set this aside for future use. Uh, that's another thing. I I'm not a hoarder. I'm not a pack rat, but I do save quite a bit. Uh, and components like this, this hub is a custom made item. They cost me forty dollars a piece to have made. The jack shaft. It's a nice case hardened jack shaft. These are are high end Torrington needle bearings with rubber seals. There's just no reason to be getting rid of something that has a, a future use, So, um, especially when you're using high-end equipment. So I'm, that's why I'm going to go ahead and save this. Um, now, and that brings me to my next point of this build. Uh, most people that build uh, custom power wheels or go-karts, they kind of go on the cheap, and I understand why. Um, I... Uh, I, I myself, uh, I like to uh, save money where I can, but uh, at the same time, I found that quality matters. And so, in this instance, building this thing, first of all, I got the Mini Model S for free through the referral program. Secondly, uh, I manufacture these drive units, and these motors are made proprietary for me. I get them at dealer cost. Um, I had this motor in stock. I had many drive unit parts in stock. This particular drive unit is a used item. It was sold to a pedal cab company for, for commercial use along with a few others. They had sent some products back to me to be serviced. and So I ended up with a few of these drive units used in stock that were pretty badly hacked. So I spent, spent a bunch of time just sanding and filing and cleaning up this drive unit. I had this motor left on the shelf. The motor controller is a surplus item that I have in stock. Uh, the aluminum tube was a lot of uh, components that I had in stock. The sprocket I had in stock. I mean, uh, a lot of it I made. The rear axle is just a piece of tube that, that I made. All of the bearing carriers and uh, bearing capture uh, clamps are just basic split collars I got from McMaster Car. So this thing is it's very, very high end in the way I'm building it. But it really isn't costing me as much as you might think. So uh, if I had to start from scratch, um, I would, I'd probably be spending upwards of $5,000 in equipment to build this. But uh, since I had much of it in stock, I might have $1,500 that I'll be spending on this. And um, so 
which to build even just a steel framed basic go-kart you're going to be into it for that by the time you actually figure everything in so um, so that's that's why I'm building this in such a high-end um, configuration aluminum frame uh, mostly aluminum drive parts and really high-end motor and high-end lithium batteries and super high horsepower and, and uh, because uh, it's I have the components but also it's not something that most people do uh, most often a project like this is done in the cheap and um, though that's fine and I understand it uh, I didn't want to go that route with this particular project so anyway enough rambling now the material that I use for jack shaft bearing tube is just basic drawn aluminum tube uh, 6061 it is inch and three eighths outside diameter, inch and one eighth inside diameter, and um, so I just cut it to length, press the bearings in, and that is my jack shaft bearing tube. Uh, I can make it any uh, length I want, and same with jack shafts, cut them any length I want, and that means I can set the offset of the drive unit away from the output sprocket to whatever distance I want. Uh, very, very important. Uh, remember that uh, this drive unit was designed for bicycles. So, uh, oh, here I can also um, illustrate this more closely to you. This is the belt tension adjustment that I pointed out before. When I turn this screw, it moves that, uh, it, it pushes on this finger and that finger pushes out on the drive unit and it adjusts the tension of the belt. So again, that's accomplished just by turning that Phillips screw it's a very, very effective means for, for belt tension adjustment. And um, it's, uh, it's a design that was born out of necessity in installing these on a bike where you can adjust things easily, make it relatively lightweight, but also the ability to shed heat from the motor. Uh, that motor heat gets shed into this entire housing. The motor will get somewhat hot and then the housing is quite warm and it's the thermal mass goes up, the surface area for shedding heat goes up, but again, it was, it was difficult to figure out how to get the belt tension adjustment uh, set in a very easy way, and this was, um, uh, this was the best method that I had come up with. This was maybe six years ago that I designed this. Um, so if you go on to the Endless Sphere uh, Bicycle Forum in the Bicycle Non-Hub section, this is called the Da Vinci Drive, and uh, my name is Recompense, uh, spelled with a U, a recompense on that forum and you can see some of the bike builds that I do so if you want to know more about the bicycle drive systems but the bulk of the projects that I work on are based around this drive system even my big 4x4 skateboard uses one of these for the front axle one for the rear it just has a motor that is shorter in length but fits in the same drive so anyway uh, I'm gonna go ahead and figure the length of this tube by um, laying it out with the jack shaft so I know what length to cut it to and I can press the bearings in, get the whole unit assembled and begin the, the mounting process on the frame. Now, in order to cut that tube, I'm gonna be using my, my band saw. So let me walk you over and, and show you this item. I think you'll get a kick out of it. In my workshop, I have a stack of equipment here and um, so this is a, uh, a Miller TIG welder. It's a Diversion 180. This is a Lincoln Electric MIG welder. Uh, it is a weld pack 100 with the gas conversion. So those are my welders up top. Below that I have a shelf with my welding helmet, welding gloves, vice grips, various clamps. And then below that I have this, this particular um, rack of equipment. So I'll set the camera down and, and show you how that works. So these two levels uh, are, um, they retract on drawer tracks. My workshop is very small. So what I did is I found a manufacturer that makes drawer tracks sort of akin to what you would have on a file cabinet, but these are, they're designed to hold 500 pounds of weight and they're locking. So I swing these tabs. Normally, when it's in its locked position, it's locked. I swing these tabs down and pull and this entire rack comes out and then it locks in the out position. So this way I can use my grinder uh, and um, I also, this shelf I have cut away so that 
I like using my band uh, or my belt sander in the upright position so it can retract into that that shelf there and then this is my band saw same thing it's on locking rails but I swing them down to unlock it put out it locks in place and then there's my my saw and then I can unlock it and slide it back in when I'm done using it so to give you guys an idea of how strong these drawer tracks are you can open it up and stand on it and I weigh 180 pounds fully clothed so um, so yeah we'll go ahead and um, use the band saw here and I do a lot of metal work uh, I had another one of these band saws I had it for 20 years and then eventually the gearbox itself wore completely out so I bought another one and uh, just from northern tools so I have to go ahead and set the fence at a 90 degree it's set for 45 degrees right now and then I'll start cutting and set our material in here to cut it at the mark that I had listed Our new bearing tube so I'm going to square off and clean off the ends go ahead and press the bearings in and um, assemble the drive unit So the ends are squared up and cleaned off. Now I'm going to bevel the inside edge and go ahead and press the bearings in and we'll be done with our jack shaft bearing tube. I'll also clean up the exterior of it uh, just to shine it up for aesthetic purposes. So the way I bevel the, the inside edge is just with a, a good solid knife. You don't want to use a utility knife for this, a thick bladed knife. And what I do is I put it on a slight angle and give it a spin and it leaves a really nice edge. Now you have to be careful not to slip off. Uh, this actually isn't a super sharp knife, but sharp enough to do the job and it leaves a nice clean bevel. So on the other side, you see that it will actually curl material off. So they do make tools for doing this, but I don't happen to own one and I found that for aluminum, a nice sharp stainless steel bladed knife works. You just have to be extra careful, but um, that's the way I bevel the inside edge. I've been doing it for many years and um, it works great. Now what I'm going to do, um, I have a bearing press, but it's not set up in my shop. So I'm going to very gently drive this in. Now you can use a vise for this purpose too, but I've gotten good at doing this in just laying the bearing on a hard surface, the tube over the top, and I have a, a soft faced plastic mallet, uh, mallet that I made. This is a tapered titanium tube uh, designed uh, for a, a bicycle fork leg. Uh, but anyway, um, so I'll be tapping this into place. Now, I normally don't recommend doing this. I normally recommend using a bearing press, but uh, again, it's something I've been doing for many years and it does work. What you don't wanna do is put the bearing on top and then tap it down because it'll end up cocking the bearing to the side. You lay the bearing on a flat surface, put the tube over the top because it's much easier to sight down the tube to keep it straight and tap down on the tube. Also, uh, it's good to do this on a very solid surface. Now this bench, it's aluminum, but it's thin walled aluminum. And I have a, a brass plate, uh, this or a, bla a brass bar. This is extremely heavy. Uh, I don't know, gosh, I'm guessing 15 pounds. And I typically do my, my bearing drifting on this plate because it's so solid, it's a very dead item. It doesn't bounce the workbench when I tap on it. So I lay a, um, a non-marring piece of material on top, either a piece of paper or something else just to protect the edge of the bearing, lay it down on the bench and drive it in. So we'll do that now. And I'll show you right here on the edge of the bench. 
So there we go. Just a few layers of paper, a little brochure there. Lay the bearing here. Put the tube over the top. One other thing is to clear any debris out with compressed air to protect the bearing. So I lay the tube over the top, make sure it's as straight as I can get it, and tap it in place. Another thing is to rotate and hit around the edge so that it, uh, it will want to walk its way over the bearing. So uh, there it is pressed in. Now I always leave a little bit of the bearing lip sticking out and there's a, a number of reasons for that. Uh, the main reason is because if it's pressing against a surface, uh, I don't necessarily need a thrust washer against it. So um, it'll be resting against this, the face of this collar. Now um, I, may, uh, I may grab a, uh, a Teflon thrust washer if I have them, but um, I found they're really not needed if there's no side load, but you don't want steel running against aluminum. You want it running against the steel edge of the bearing. So I always leave just a touch. I'll probably drive it in a little bit more, but I always leave just a little bit of that bearing hanging out the edge. Now we'll do the bearing in the other side. So uh, the jack shaft will go through that bearing tube and then the sprocket gets mounted on the end. So we'll put the bearing tube in the drive unit here. Right. Now uh, earlier I showed you earlier I showed you this mount foot. Well I changed my mind. I'm not going to use this mount foot. Uh, I've got a different mount foot. Let me show you that. Put this back here. This is the other design mount foot. Now, you see the difference here. They both hold the same jack shaft, and uh, they're different in height and also in offset. This one, the tube is, the jack shaft tube is offset from the mount. This one is symmetrical, but the main thing is this particular mount foot has slots in it, and those slots allow it to move fore and aft. Uh, initially, I was going to use this mount and then install aluminum plates on the frame that would have slots machined in them so this could move forward and back in the slots on the frame. This particular mount will allow it to move forward and back. I can just put simple holes in the plates in the frame and still allow the fore and aft adjustment by using this mount foot. So again, bicycle, uh, electric bicycle, high-end drive system uh, parts for my drive units that I've been manufacturing for years is where I'm getting all these components. So this is kind of cool. These are um, these are our uh, drive system mount brackets uh, that were manufactured for uh, installing these drives to square tubing, and you'll notice that they fit directly over that tube there. So these mount clamps were designed to clamp to an inch and a half uh, box tube. Now this frame happens to be one inch. Uh, one inch by inch and a half. So it does fit in one dimension, but uh, it's too narrow in the other dimension uh, to properly grasp the, uh, the drive unit. But uh, I think I can, um, think I can use these. What I'm, I think I'm going to do is um, uh, use these as mounting tabs that I can weld right to the frame. But I have a box full of these that I'm never going to use. So um, these would normally they capture around the frame and then they, the drive unit would, would screw through them and you can adjust it fore and aft on the frame and adjust the drive unit within these. But I think what I'm going to do is um, cut these and weld them to the frame uh, as tabs to mount the drive unit to. So I can mount that right to the main, to the main frame rail and I may use a second mount to support the weight because it will be cantilevered. Not sure I have to decide on that yet, but uh, this would be the easiest method, I think, to, to install the drive unit. So we'll go ahead and start working on that.
Well, I think I've decided on, I'm going to shim, uh, shim these clamps out so I don't need to weld them to the frame. I can just clamp them directly to the frame. I think that might be my best option. So I need to increase the clamping surface by an extra uh, quarter inch per side. So I've got some quarter inch aluminum plate here that I'm going to cut in the bandsaw to uh, fit and uh, work uh, as shims to shim these spacer or these clamps out from the frame a little bit. All right, so I've got a bracket cutting in the saw. And while that's cutting, I'm going to go ahead and assemble the pulley under the jack shaft here. two quarter inch thick shims. They will go between the, um, the mount clamps and the frame rail on the car to space the, um, the clamps out to make this inch and a half high, one inch narrow uh, frame tube into inch and a half square for the drive unit mount foot to mount on. So I'm just now assembling that and installing it. So what I'm doing in this step is uh, we need to put a pass-through bolt uh, through these two clamps. One side's a clear hole, the other side is just a clear hole. Well, normally you would have a screw going through each side threading into uh, a, uh, a threaded area of the drive unit, but in this case it's clear all the way through, so I need to machine a recess to slide a nut into. So I still have to deburr the edges, but you can see the nut slides right down into that, into that opening. So that's what I'm doing in this step here. One down, one to go. You can see how that nut recesses nicely in there. Excellent. So here is the drive unit um, uh, jack shaft bearing tube mount installed. So this jack shaft will go through there. But uh, you can see that uh, it moves forward and back in these uh, the slotted holes here, and uh, that forward that forward and back um, motion allows for chain adjustment. So the only concern that I wasn't even thinking about before is these clamps now hang down below the frame, so there's still uh, about an inch of clearance there. Uh, and it's not really far back, but uh, if they hit anything, then I can always resort to welding these tabs to the frame. But for now, it's what I had, so uh, we'll run that clamp mount and uh, see how it does long term. All right, so here we go. I've got the, the drive unit just basic mounted here, and um, I wanted to show you guys the... Um, wanted to show you guys the the way it was all laid out and uh, so very shiny lots of bling so the um, I'll be putting the belt on in a minute here but um, for now I just wanted to show you the chain so with the rear wheel removed you can see the the chain going from the drive unit sprocket to the uh, uh, to the axle and um, as I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, this actually is a freewheel. So it will freewheel in the one direction and it grabs and drives in the other. And so, and then this moves fore and aft in the mounts to uh, make chain uh, um, tension adjustments. So these two Allen screws, which are 3 sixteenths, uh, 3 sixteenths Allen, once those are snug down, then the chain will hold its adjustment. So We'll go ahead and snug those.
So there we go. And uh, so the entire unit is mounted and uh, the chain is installed. But uh, so you can see the, um, the, uh, the motor will drive the motor will drive the primary belt, uh, which is here. I'll go ahead and put that on next. Uh, to the main pulley, which drives the jack shaft, to drive the chain to the rear wheel. Now, for those of you that are wondering why I don't just run uh, from the motor right to the axle, a uh, bunch of reasons. Uh, the main reason is that the motor runs at very high RPM. This motor will run over 10,000 RPM. And to gear it down low enough to do the roughly 25 miles per hour that I want it to go, uh, doing it in one stage just isn't isn't feasible. I'd have to use a very small pitch chain from the motor to the axle and then a huge sprocket at the wheels, which I don't like a, a large sprocket. It's too easy to hit things on the ground. And a chain uh, on this, uh, this shaft, uh, the sprocket, I'd have to run a very, very small pitch sprocket and it would be really noisy. Now, normally with a gas engine, the engine's so loud that you can't really hear the chain noise. But on an electric drive system, you hear chain noise, so you want to run a belt. And running a belt from the, the wheels, there's, I've got my own set of issues with doing that. So really from super high RPM down to a lower RPM, in this instance, a two-stage works best. Uh, for high RPM, low torque, a belt works best. And for low RPM, high torque, a chain is best. This is a BMX bicycle chain. This is a standard chain. Uh, once I make sure the gear ratio is correct when running it, then um, and I don't need to change sprockets, then I'll go ahead and move to a heavy-duty chain, which is uh, thicker but still runs in the same sprockets. But for now, this will be fine. In fact, this chain, this chain would be more than strong enough, but it would wear quicker. So I will go to a heavier-duty chain once I have the, the car all built and finished. So... Uh, next, I'll go ahead and put the belt on and put the back wheel back on again. And, um, yeah, it, uh, it's coming together. It looks very technical, and uh, I love the, uh, the high-end appearance of the drive unit. And I think the chassis as a whole is coming out very well, and um, I'm excited to, to uh, get it all together. Uh, just in case you're wondering, this pulley is above the height of the, of the frame spars, and um, so... It won't hit the ground. There will be one frame support in front of it anyway, and it will be protected. But it's up off the ground more so than the frame uh, frame rails are. So we'll go ahead and put the belt on and put the back wheel back on. Just give you a real slow, real slow walk around here. Now also, I mentioned this in the last video, but uh, these bearing carriers for the rear axle, they're just tack welded down right now. There will be gussets on, uh, on both of these bearing carriers going down to the frame. So there'll be 45 degree gussets on both sides on both bearing carriers. So I know that's weak right now, right there. That's just tack welded for the time being. I'll finish weld it um, soon. The, um, the seat will go basically right up here. So um, it'll be kind of curved right up there and uh, curved this way to clear the, it'll clear the brake disc and the sprocket and then curve up there. Very, very tight. Uh, every, every inch makes a big difference on this thing. Now, um, the drive unit, I wanted to move it centered rather than right, right at the rear wheel for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, one of which is because the body curves here. Uh, I wanted it symmetrical. I wanted the weight centered. Now, it's not, the drive unit isn't perfectly centered. Actually, the belt is pretty well perfectly centered here. Um, the drive unit is offset a little to the left. That was done for a handful of reasons that I, I decided on that. One was length of the, the jack shaft. I didn't have a longer jack shaft to make the, the bearing tube and shaft longer to step it over further. Uh, a second reason is, if I stepped it over further, there's a lot of weight then hanging on this point. And I thought, you know, I'd rather not make another mount over here. Uh, this is plenty strong as long as it's not cantilevering too much weight over to the side. Um, I'll probably put a support strut from the drive unit down to the frame. But 
um, I, I didn't want to have to um, worry about another large mount. And if I moved the whole drive unit over further, I was a little bit worried that there, when I'd hit bumps, that the whole drive unit would be jerking to the side. So that was a concern. Also, I wanted to free up some space over here. The brake caliper is going to be behind the disc here. And so that's going to uh, take up some space. And then right here, I'm going to mount a platform with the motor controller. So I need room for the motor controller and brake caliper. And um, so that will that will kind of dominate the uh, the rear of the of the chassis uh, on the right side. So uh, this was a good compromise to get the drive unit kind of offset to the right a bit uh, near the middle, uh, so it wasn't just hanging way off to the side and still allowing space for the components that need to be mounted. So we'll go ahead and put the rear wheel on. We'll just set it in place so you can see it for now. So there it is just set in place. So there's the rear of the car and uh, freewheeling and then back spinning to, to engage and drive the drive unit. So you can see plenty of clearance between the tire and the sprockets there. Excellent. So one thing I wanted to show you guys is how um, how precise all of this is. Give it a spin, and that uh, freeze free wheels very nicely. So there is the uh, there's the drive all set up, and um, so looking forward to continuing the build. And uh, not a hundred percent sure what I'm going to do as the next step. Um, Maybe mount the battery pack, get the body installed. I don't know. We'll, we'll see.